Well, 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 Professor Michael Mann, the world's top climate scientist, we meet again. It took less than 60 seconds for whoever you have managing your Twitter account to block me when I commented about our previous interactions and started delivering facts on your recent post promoting your new book. So I figured since you aren't going to allow me a voice there, I'm going to allow my own voice here and encourage all of my viewers to go ahead and post this on all of your Twitter uh, posts from now on. So first thing I want to start with is this. This is really all you need to know in order to take a look at the modern global warming story and throw it in the trash. Modern global warming, one degree so far in about 150 years, and that's being generous. It's probably closer to 200. A Dansgaard Oshker event is up to eight degrees of warming in as little as 40 years. These are not comparable. And what's interesting is none of these Dansgaard Oshker events, of which there are dozens and dozens recorded into the past, have ever resulted in runaway warming. In fact, what happens is they melt the polar ice, that polar ice, chills and freshens the oceans, allowing more ice to develop at the polar regions eventually, which reflects more heat off into space, and the cooler, fresher oceans end up chilling the atmosphere and the entire Earth stabilizes. This is an Earth safety mechanism. It's one of the ways that Earth prevents itself from having those runaway effects. But just in case this is a little much for you or you don't like the name Dansgaard Oshker event, Here's a video we did last year called Climate Science Destroyed in Eight Minutes. We're gonna let you watch it right now. And because it is pretty rapid fire and your brain needs to be pretty much a tier one level in order to comprehend and process everything, after it's done, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But for now, enjoy. The collapse of the climate science you know has already been published by top researchers in top journals. Someone just needs to point out all the pieces that are already here. This may look confusing, but admit it, it's pretty. And this is the outline of the demise of climate science. We're going to run them down one by one, starting with the failures of the science. A1, failure to predict the future. At no point have the climate models accurately modeled the future. The official observed temperatures have consistently come in below the scary global warming numbers. And it's one thing to not be able to predict the future. But when your models can't predict the past, that's a problem. A2. This was the case with the recent surveys of the climate world, finding the high sensitivity in conflict with the paleoclimate data. And this is a ubiquitous feature among the climate models, the inability to even reproduce the data when we extend the timeline into the past. A3 and A4 can almost be combined as oversensitivity and heat bias to CO2 combines with the uncertainties in aerosol and cloud forcing as one of the major causes of these model failures. They trigger bias development in the oceans that becomes troubling in only six months into simulations. And recently, when half of Arctic warming was blamed on ozone loss, which is actually a third of all global warming, it told us that the heat that has been blamed on carbon all these years is a fantasy. The questions surrounding carbon have been a prominent piece of the literature the last 18 months, along with the identification and quantification of the uncertainties, which again, always seem to skew one way, heat bias. A5 is the lowering of climate sensitivity, which is not only expressly favored in the paleoclimate disagreement studies, but the lack of specific changes that would absolutely be expected if they had the models right and which are simply not being seen, further pushes towards the library of studies out in the last two years favoring a less extreme version of global warming and lower climate sensitivity to carbon. And it is not just uncertainty and heat bias that fails to predict the future or the past, but the data itself has come under major question just this year by the world's number one climate journal. We won't see this on CNN. We've seen the accusations about temperature adjustments into the past and climate gate emails about how they were going to rig the data. But the urban heat island effect at A6 adds on a major source of doubt to the realization that something else is happening in the climate. A7 is a point of discussion. Anytime someone points to studies about how global warming is going to get us all or there's a consensus in the science, those are the studies that have the bias, uncertainty, urban heat island effects, and which can't predict the future or the past. A8. Yes, folks, the changes we are seeing are going to trigger an ice age. When the water is locked as ice at the poles, the oceans are more saline and the mid-latitudes are temperate. 
Melting the ice at the poles affects the heat transport in the oceans and triggers rapid cooling towards ice age conditions. Not to mention those major snow and cold events that have crippled parts of Europe and more recently, Texas. Climate models fail tremendously at their foundations, and the studies saying otherwise are guilty of an A-list violation, or multiple, and at the end of the day, it's all leading to cold anyway. Section B is unappreciated forcing, the things that are really affecting the climate. Starting at B1, volcanoes. This is the volcanic aerosol cooling of the atmosphere during the time of official climate science. The problem is that this is the data from the U.S. government on volcanic cooling going back more than a millennia. That green box on the right is what I showed before, the time of official climate science, and we are not only missing the true forcing power of volcanoes when we skew the timeline, but we haven't had any major cooling effect from them in centuries. When they ask where the century of heat we just had came from, if we're cutting back the carbon blame, part of the answer is that volcanoes have been taking it easy on us, not blocking out as much light. And then you move on to B2, where you add more to the equation to make up for CO2. These are all the published and confirmed correlations and mechanisms of solar forcing of the atmosphere, and here is what official climate science allows into the discussion, just irradiance, which not only misses the majority of ways the sun affects us with its particle and field forcing, which is a massive blunder to anyone who can grasp the energy conversion of particles to light, that's right, and the way they do irradiance is nonsensical as well. This is our favorite recent example, the irradiance and therefore solar climate forcing in official climate models during the September 2017 solar storms, the largest in 12 years. Yes, some spectra of UV dropped, and in official climate models, it says the sun gave us less energy, but x-rays surged by a thousand, particle bombardment surged by a factor of 10,000, and folks, it was a massive energy input to our planet that showed up as negative solar forcing in official climate models. By the way, the entirety of solar forcing is organized into a climate playlist that can be found linked right below this video, where you can learn what the real effect of those solar storms were on the planet. Cosmic rays are where they fail again to appreciate the sun. Where the sun is weak, it not only gives us less energy, but it blocks out fewer cosmic rays, which trigger cloud condensation and attract dust and vapor particles to enhance the albedo cooling. When the sun is active, it blocks out those cosmic rays, in addition to giving us more energy. That makes it a double whammy of heating versus cooling that, again, is not factored into climate models. The literature from the last decade on cosmic rays and lightning has also been solidified in the last two years as well. So just to clarify, that plays into both A3 and A4 along with the volcanoes in the sun. And now get this, they not only can't predict the future or the past, they peg CO2 as the problem along with uncertainties. Low carbon sensitivity is favored and the changes that we're seeing are actually going to lead to cold. The climate has much more to do with volcanoes, the sun, and cosmic ray modulation than is allowed into climate models. And on top of all of that, the sun has had an easier road to warming the planet with our magnetic field fading. It's not just more blame for the sun, but its doorway has actually become a floodgate. And then, of course, there is the mechanism in the atmosphere that makes a lot of these electrodynamic couplings work, the global electric circuit. There is no aspect of geophysics outpacing the growth of this field over the last decade, and the studies have just been waiting to pour their answers on how clouds and pressure cells are subject to manipulation electrically. Key recent ones solidify that electrical path over those currently working in climate models. They confirm and better characterize the rapid forcing, like somewhere between the speed of light and 10 seconds to affect the entire world electrically. And the key aspect of the field forcing has been described now too. We waited years for this one, and now it's giving climate scientists nightmares. Here's one that won't go into print until June, but it's going to be another slam dunk for these electrical pathways, connecting them with the solar fields, the IMF, which means the global electric circuit is actually a solar system electric circuit. You can find my favorite 500 solar climate forcing papers as of 2020 in one place, spaceweathernews.com publications. For every one I showed in this video, there are dozens I didn't. When you enter this discussion with someone else, it's their failure to predict, their bias, their uncertainty, favoring lower sensitivity, and reality is that we're heading for an ice age. Studies saying we're in danger from heat are guilty of that bias, uncertainty, and inability to predict. They don't use solar particles or field forcing, or an appropriate treatment of volcanoes, solar irradiance, the magnetic field, or the global electric circuit. And when they can't counter the model failures, the bias, and the cooling trends, or the treatment of the sun, volcanoes, or electromagnetism, they will attack the source, the speaker, 
and then you know you won. Read below for more. So you all followed all that, right? Just in case you didn't. Up first, climate models absolutely fail to predict the future. They have been predicting this ridiculous warming now for several decades. Don't forget, several individuals thought that by this time, there would be no more ice in the polar regions. We would have seen the end of snow, the end of cold records, and of course, none of that has taken place. Climate models fail to predict the future. But what's even worse is climate models fail to predict the past. When they take this CO2 temperature correlation that they have somehow woven together over the last 150 years or so, and they take that back, and they take a look at the CO2 records and the reconstructed temperatures into the past, they don't match up. And the further you go back into the past, the worse they match up. And so, they fail to predict the future and they fail to predict the past in what's called the paleoclimate disagreement. That alone should be enough for you to realize, on top of those Dansgaard Oshker events, that this story is not making any sense. The cloud, uh, the, the cloud and aerosol uncertainties, the CO2 oversensitivity and bias, I know I just swapped three and four there, but they go together. Um, these things really all come together in the more minute problems that these models actually have. They all have the warming bias. They all show an oversensitivity to CO2, which creates the problem in A1, the fact that they can't predict the future. Uh, there's just an unbelievable bias towards these, uh, towards these heating effects of, of the human effect here. And as we saw in this paper a couple of days ago, what they thought about the clouds is even worse for their global warming story. They thought that certain processes were going to take place that would really enhance and speed up the warming, and it turns out that is just not what's going to happen at all. The urban heat island effect, can't stress this enough. So many of the actual temperature gauges are in areas that look nothing like they looked 30 years ago, 60 years ago. They are taking in the urban heat island effect and making it seem like the planet is getting a lot warmer than it actually is. There is some excellent work uh, on this in the journals, but also from Dr. Roy Spencer. Uh, if you look at drroyspencer.com, he's the former NASA scientist, uh, climate scientist. He's got some really good stuff out just this year on exactly how bad the urban heat island effect really is and how much it is skewing what we uh, what we look at uh, in terms of global warming. Uh, A7, the AGW, which stands for Anthrop Anthropogenic Global Warming Studies, they all use flawed models. That's the A1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 that we just went over. All of those studies that are blaming us, that say this is a terrible thing, it's out of control, it's going to ruin the world and it's all our fault, they all suffer from these problems we just went over. And of course, uh, if you didn't catch A8, everything suggests that the melting of the polar ice that we're seeing will trigger uh, eventually an ice age. Uh, not only what we briefly mentioned with the dansgaard Oshker events, but at the rate at which it's going, it's going to trigger a Heinrich event, or worse, the re-entry into a glacial cycle. By the way, this nice last 12,000 years we call the Holocene, the interglacial warm period, is overdue for a dive back into the glacial cycle. And we're doing, uh, we're, we're either doing or seeing uh, everything that we would expect to see while we're on our way back down there. Then of course we have the unappreciated forcing. Um, volcanoes are starting to be better represented in some of the climate models, but not really even to the degree that reflects reality. The next time we get a major VEI-7 or God forbid a VEI-8, it's going to take multiple degrees off the temperature, going to make what global warming there has been over the last 150 years look like peanuts, um, just a matter of weeks, maybe a couple of months. Of course, the sun, they uh, this is their bread and butter, ignoring the sun. It's almost as much of a bread and butter as it is blaming humans for global warming. Particle forcing, the magnetic fields, hundreds and hundreds of studies just completely left out of the climate models in terms of how they affect the planet. And the same goes for cosmic rays, B3. Um, there has been 
literally just a couple of experiments that seem to question it, but they are far outweighed, at least 10 to 1, by the studies that are finding these correlations between cosmic rays and clouds, which of course play a significant role not only in everyday weather, but in the albedo effect, where they reflect sunlight back off into space. We still don't have good studies on the geomagnetic field and how it has been weakening for the last 150 to 200 years, uh, pretty much lining up right with global warming. And when you ignore the sun and cosmic rays, yeah, it's easier to ignore Earth's magnetic field changes because you're tricked into thinking, oh, this just doesn't matter. In fact, we uh, made a video on this just a couple of uh, weeks ago when several experts attempted to debunk this position, this point, and um, let's just say it was not a pretty sight for those experts. And last but not least, the way that this all works is the global electric circuit. None of the studies about the global electric circuit are in the climate models, and I mean absolutely none of them. This is probably the prime way that the solar wind and other elements of space weather which impact the upper layers of the atmosphere, the ionosphere, directly and nearly instantaneously impact the ground layer, the, the lowest layers of the atmosphere. And so this literally, I wish it was simpler, but again, at least, uh, at least I made it in pretty colors here. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that should make any rational individual get behind the modern climate discourse, the new green agenda, any of those things, this net zero nonsense. And this list that you have right here, this doesn't even include the Dansgaard Oshker events, which again, by themselves, make you look at modern global warming and say, this is absolutely nothing. Anyway, I'll see you in the morning for the daily show. Thanks for the opportunity, Dr. Man. And uh, observers, why don't you go say hello to him over on Twitter? Be safe, everyone.